Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the event this evening, organised by Wirral Climate Action Group with support from Hope for the Future. I don't want to speak for too long as we've got such an exciting and action packed schedule to get through this evening. But my name is Laura and I'm the Northwest Coordinator at Hope for the Future and also a member of Wirral Climate Action Group. Very shortly, I'll pass over to Ed Lamb to introduce Wirral Climate Action Group. But if you haven't heard of Hope for the Future already, we're a climate communications charity which works nationally to equip communities and individuals to communicate the urgency of climate change with their local politicians. We feel it's vitally important that MPs and constituents have rich conversations about the climate. As part of Hope for the Future's work, we're able to support events across the country, hence the collaboration with Rural Climate Action Group this evening. And this is the event we have for you. I just want to start by briefly taking you through the shape of this evening's event so you know what you're in for. We focus the theme of transport this evening by splitting it up into three main parts. So after we've heard from Ed about Rural Climate Action Group, we'll kick off with part one by looking at the current state of travel and transport on the Wirral and the progress towards our current targets. We're beginning with an overview of the Liverpool City Region Transport Strategy from Simon O'Brien, Liverpool's Cycling and Walking Commissioner. We'll then get an overview of progress against Wirral's transport strategy and progress towards Wirral's climate change strategy too. We'll also hear from Dr David Tarthy, Respiratory Specialist at Arrow Park Hospital, talking about the effects of air pollution on our health. We'll then jump straight into a Q&A with each speaker in part one. In part two, we'll look forwards to the potential solutions available to ensure access to sustainable and affordable travel right here on the Wirral. In this part of the event, we'll be hearing short presentations from Warren Ward at the Wirral Chamber of Commerce, Janet Atherton at Cycling UK, and Ellis Palmer, disabled journalist and hand cycle, hand cycle user, before we go into another Q&A. Then in part three, we'll be hearing from the MPs who are joining us today to reflect on the local situation and talk about some of the action that needs to be taken. We'll have Q&A with the MPs too. And just to say a huge big welcome and thank you to Mick Whitley and Angela Eagle for joining us this evening and also to Margaret Greenwood, who'll be joining us shortly after. There'll be opportunity for you to get involved today and have your say in the latter section of the event. But in the meantime, please do use the chat for your thoughts and your ideas and let us know why you're joining, why you're with us. We are also meant to be joined by a representative from Mersey Travel this evening, but unfortunately they had to pull out. Um, but we will be putting all relevant questions to Mersey Travel for written responses, um, which we'll share with all attendees who are with us today. And as you can see, it's a very packed schedule. Um, so just lastly, some from me, very quick housekeeping. This webinar will be recorded and it will be available on demand for you to watch again and to share. We'll be sending everyone here today a follow up email next week with the link to the recording and to direct you to a range of resources. We'll be doing our absolute best to stick to time um, and each of our presenters will be speaking for around five minutes and we're scheduled to finish before 9 p.m. Finally, I'd just like to ask that everyone is respectful of all the contributions given in today's event from both the speakers and other attendees in the chat. So now I'm pleased to hand over to Ed Lamb, Director of Rethink Now and active member of Rural Climate Action Group. Thanks, Ed. Fantastic. Thank you, Laura. And yeah, let me start by saying a massive thank you to Hope for the Future for their help organising and promoting the event tonight, a particular massive weight off my shoulders after I did all the technical stuff at our first event back in December. Uh, thanks also a huge thanks to our speakers for giving up some of their time on a Friday night to share their expertise with us. You could have been partying in Liverpool, but you came here instead. Love it. So World Climate Action Group is a fledgling organisation that seeks to gather together an army of local citizens to find local solutions to our global environmental crisis. Our first event took place back in December. As I say, like, uh, like tonight, uh, we hosted MPs, councillors and local experts to discuss the climate crisis and our response on Wirral. Tonight, we focus on transport, an area that has stubbornly refused to budge when we look at the climate data. We'll be talking about electric cars, yes, but we'll probably, more importantly, be talking bikes, buses, trains, 
I'm walking. We should never forget walking. Transport is a personal obsession of mine. Uh, it encompasses a huge range of issues that we must address in parallel if we are to define uh, the work of the next 10 years and more as a success. So yeah, we do need to eliminate tailpipe emissions from all our vehicles, but also we need to think about air pollution. We need to think about accessibility so people of all ages and abilities can move from place to place. We need to, uh, to fix massive issues relating to public health, both physical and mental, uh, which can be done as we use our bodies a little bit more for transport. We can rethink the public realm, how we view the spaces beyond our front doors and how we use them. A road can be used as a football pitch for kids just as easily uh, as it can be a place for moving, moving through. And of course, we need to address the huge danger that our roads bring. Uh, and I say that uh, in the week where 15 year old Jack Jones was killed in Upton by a driver as he made his way home. Uh, it's the latest in a depressingly long uh, line of victims. So yeah, we've got a lot of work to do, but as with many environmental problems, the solutions are a lot closer than we think. And uh, if, we, if we take them forward, they can lead us to a much happier and healthier world. I'd like to thank Roger Phillips uh, once again for agreeing to take charge proceedings. We're, re we're as ever we're in safe hands when Roger's in charge. Thanks everyone for coming along. I hope you enjoy the event and Roger, it's over to you. Thanks a lot, Ed. I'm not sure about safe hands, but anyhow, it's now time for this first section in which, as I said, we're going to look at the current state of travel and transport on the Wirral. And to set the scene, we're going to start with an overview of progress on the Liverpool City Region Transport Strategy from Simon O'Brien. We'll then get an overview of our progress against targets for decarbonising travel and transport on the Wirral, specifically from Councillor Liz Gray. We'll then hear from the respiratory specialist, Dr David Gray, who will talk, Dr. David Tatley, who will talk us through the health impacts of transport-related air pollution and after those three speakers, a Q&A to conclude part one. So please do submit questions to the speakers in this section using the Q&A function. But I have to point out that we've already had a lot of pre-submitted questions from all three Q&As. But never fear, any questions not answered this evening will be put to panellists to provide a written response. And so to Simon, Liverpool Cycling and Walking Commissioner, whose work across all six boroughs helping to make the Metropolitan Mayor's vision for a revolution in actual travel a reality. He's helped to deliver the Metropolitan Mayor Steve Rotherham's vision for an active travel revolution across Holton, Nosley, Liverpool, St Helens, Southampton, and Wirral. He is, of course, also well known for presenting roles on BBC Two's Rough Guys series and Channel 4's Find It, Fix It, Flog It. Simon swapped his car for a bike 35 years ago because, as well as being such a fantastic way of getting around, it addresses climate change, air pollution, and helps people's mental and physical health. So, over to you, Simon. Thanks, Roger. Uh, yeah, so thanks for having me on. And uh, I'll focus on Wirral in, in a moment because that's the, the purpose of this evening. But just to give you a general overview of kind of what's going on across the, the city region in my role as Cycling and Walking Commissioner, I've spent kind of the last ooh, quarter of the year, three months, trying to drive home the importance of a document that came out last year, the Gear Change LTM 120. It's the first document from central government I've seen for some 20 years, which actually has the teeth to change the way we look at how our transport systems work and more importantly, are funded. And so a large part of my role going forward, as well as helping with communications and messaging uh, from the mayor's office and the Liverpool city region, will just be to make sure that everything from planning to, to, to regeneration, to transport, all adhere to LTN 120 and gear change. If you haven't read it, read it, take it all in and use it as a stick with every single member of every single council you know. So focusing on Wirral, uh, how are we doing on Wirral? Well, I would say along with the UK and the rest of the city region at this point, appallingly. I think we all have to admit that, you know, for the, in 10 years ago, climate change was, was firmly on the mainstream agenda and everyone was saying the words. We've had climate emergencies declared across all boroughs. And yet in that 10 years, there are now 1.4 million miles, more motorized vehicle miles since 10 years ago in our city region. And Willow pays a large part in that. That said, that's the beating. I, um, I would also go on to say that I deal with all the different boroughs. And I have to say that when it comes to engaging in active travel and with my agenda in particular, we're, we're all we're the first ones to step forward and continue to engage with me throughout. 
They are really, really visionary. And if their vision can be put in place, then it would work. Let's have a look at the Birkenhead 2040 vision with the Dock Branch Park running through the middle of it. If I read the whole document front to back this week, and if that is if that becomes a reality, then Birkenhead would literally become an exemplar for others to follow. Willow Waters is also going in the right direction. I think with a bit of a push and a shove and a tweak here and there, that really could be a development that moves into the 21st century and takes away the reliance of having to travel around everywhere in a motor car. And also some of the EATF tranche one funding that was, that was spent shows what's possible if done, what, what even when done very quickly. In particular, I'd note the A41 extension. It's imperfect, but it's a start and it starts to change the street, streetscape and give, give more space to cyclists and pedestrians. The LC Whip is progressing slowly, uh, the, the route from Birkenhead up to uh, New Brighton. It, it, when I say slowly, because there's mischief making along the way, uh, a while ago, I rode the, the entire route. And I have to say that it, 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 it seems to me a very well thought out route. It was very, very well considered by the engineers that were asked to, to scope it and, and, to, and to plan it. It goes directly from where you want it to go. But of course, then it starts to bite when people start to realize that it will change the streetscape around them. And I have to say that standing outside uh, on a very wide road where a segregated cycle lane wouldn't make any real difference to traffic flows and watching a, a, a family bounce up and down the pavements with their kids to stay safe, uh, going past a house with five Austri parking spaces with a poster in its window saying no to cycling chaos kind of keep, leaves me bewildered and but also as a reminder of kind of how we have to keep progressing the message and keep this whole thing going forward. So in summary, I would say that Wirral are really, really pushing to go in the right direction. There's politicking going on here and there, but all in all of all the boroughs, it's Wirral who have stepped forward and if they keep their plans going and keep the momentum going, then good things will happen and could happen quickly. Thanks, Roger. Thank you very much. Nice and positive there. Thanks very much indeed, Simon. Good to speak to you. Now then, Councillor Elizabeth Gray. She's the Chair of the Environment, Climate Emer Emergency and Transport Committee of Wirral Council. She's also a Ward Councillor of Bidston and St James. This is involved in a whole host of organisations. Just to take two examples, Liverpool City Region Air Quality Task Force, the Parking and Traffic Regulations Committee for Outside London. She has recently received a handwritten letter from Sir David Attenborough commending the council for the efforts that have been made to improve biodiversity in Hoylake and elsewhere in the borough. So over to you, Liz. Thanks, Roger. Um, I'm just going to quickly run through. I know you're very strict with the timing, so I'll just quickly run through what we are doing and what we're planning on doing. Um, our aims are to uh, reduce car use um, and to increase active travel. And by, by that, we mean walking, cycling, horse riding, anything that's not a motor vehicle. Uh, to do that, we have been giving more and better space, we hope, to pedestrians and cyclists so that all new infrastructure planning should be now, should be pr prioritizing active travel. And we are working with the transport providers um, to link active travel infrastructure with buses and trains and promote the multimodal journeys where cycling and walking alone might not be attractive or might not be possible. We're also looking at car clubs and promoting car sharing. Uh, we are aware that electric vehicles are not the be all and end all and won't solve most problems, but they are a stepping stone in the right direction. And they'll certainly go a long way towards resolving um, the issues of air pollution, which we really wanna take seriously. So. Uh, we've been putting in charging points. We did a consultation. We identified where there was a demand for electric vehicles, but no off-street parking to charge them easily. So we've been putting in charging points um, in some terrace streets where we know there is a demand for electric vehicles. We've also been putting them into some public buildings as well. We've been trialing e-cargo bikes with some local businesses, uh, a college, our own staff, uh, to try and reduce the van use and that, that last bit of the journey that uh, can cause a lot of pollution and congestion. Um, we are planning a cycle network for the whole of the borough, basically, uh, not just the big high end, high spec, high spend um, cycle routes, but also the little in between bits that are really essential if we're going to get people to use those big cycle routes. 
um, because they've got to get from their home to the to the best cycle route. So we want to make sure they can do that safely. And as Simon pointed out, the, the funding is vital from the government. It's often drip fed with very, very short notice. And so we want to have the plans ready so they are good, high quality plans on the shelf, ready for when uh, funding is announced. And then we can, we're more likely to be successful. And it's all going to be, you know, the idea is to have a plan that's all joined up a borough wide cycle network it was the first thing I asked for when I became a councillor and it's really that's really dear to my heart that um any I can provide plans for what we've done what we are doing what we're going to do but obviously we haven't got time to go through that now but I can I'll happily do that on request other plans include school streets we've got we're trialing with six schools different techniques for closing the street uh, at drop off and pick up time and that's been held up by over a year because of COVID and lockdown and we can't do it when schools are closed. Um, but that's that's still going ahead and we're quite excited about that. Uh, we've got plans for quite a few low traffic neighbourhoods. Again, I, I can provide details if people want to know more about that. Uh, in order to mitigate against the, the sort of politicising and, and the backlash that, that was referred to before, um, we are ramping up the education, the comms, the, the outreach. So we've got adult and child cycle training. We've got living streets working in schools. We've got our own road safety team um, working with schools, businesses and older people and winning awards for that as well. And then perhaps for me, the most important bit is the road safety review. So none of this will work if we don't have massively improved road safety and perceived improvements in road safety as well. Otherwise people are gonna barricade themselves in their cars. So my committee um, developed, worked really hard and developed some recommendations for the new Wirral road safety strategy based on vision zero, which is nobody killed or, or seriously injured as, as its ambition. So we've got 20 mile per hour speed limits in those recommendations. We've got an audit of junctions and safer junctions. We've got uh, road safety training for all councillors delivered in consultation with campaigners and activists, just like our carbon literacy training that we're rolling out. Uh, we've got all highway infrastructure spending must promote road safety and we've got more and better enforcement because it's no it's no good having all those rules and ideas if you don't enforce them so things like speeding pavement parking th these are all going to be part of the enforcement program to do that we're going to have to work better with the police and the pcc and i've had conversations with with emily spurl about doing that as well so it's good to know people are on board. Um, this, our strategy, our road safety strategy will align with the Liverpool City Region Road Strategy, but also it will align with our climate emergency strategy. Um, and obviously it all comes together. Then you've got better health and wellbeing, you've got cleaner air, reduced greenhouse gas emissions, better road safety and connectivity with communities not cut, cut up and divided by dangerous roads. So that's what we are doing now as a council and the regen just means we've got even more opportunity to do it and get it right. So I hope that makes sense and I'm happy to explain um, to anybody if that doesn't make sense. That's it. Thanks very much indeed, that's great Liz. Now then, uh, we move to Dr. David Tarpey, who is clinical lead for respiratory medicine at Wirral University Teaching Hospital. He was brought up and educated in Wirral, went to the University of Liverpool, worked in Merseyside for his whole career, and his primary focus uh, is, oh my goodness, yeah, I've lost my script because of what's happened. Let me just do that. Right, and his primary focus uh, is on the management of airways disease, such as asthma and COPD. He's a lead for Wirral's community respiratory services, and he's passionate about reducing health inequalities across the borough, inequalities that are made worse by air pollution and by the environment we all live in. So over to you, David. Hi, Ed. Thanks for the introduction, Roger. So um, I'm just going to take through a bit of, uh, <clears throat> obviously, air quality and its effects on health is electric cause in itself and probably a, a, you know, a degree in itself. So, so I've only got five minutes. I'm just going to focus on a couple of quick things. Um, so this is a quote um, that I quite like. It's a sang Sanskrit quote, and it's, um, for breath is life, so if you breathe well, you will live long. And, uh, so we've known for 7,000 plus years that you need to breathe well, and we need to, um, you know, how important um, breathing unpolluted air is and how important it is to breathe. And, you know, Hippocrates in, in ancient Greek times also picked on a pack that um, the air quality affected your health. But it's no good being able to breathe as, as well as you can like, but if what you're breathing is a bit rubbish. So there's sort of ways to think about this, the sort of natural air pollution. So occasionally, particularly in parts of the world, you can have pollen storms that can really affect people with respiratory disease. And there's a, there's a famous, infamous one really that um, 
in Melbourne where a pollen storm came in and, uh, and sadly led to the deaths of, of tens of people with asthma. Um, but what we're really talking about is sort of um, what we've done to our air quality. And poor air quality is linked to between 28 and 36,000 deaths, premature deaths a year. And there's reductions in, reductions there, well, it, to reduce that, if you improve the air quality, it can lead to reduced deaths. So in 2008, the Olympics were in Beijing and the um, Chinese government um, cleaned up a lot of the air quality for the, for the period of the Olympics. And you can actually measure it in people's bloods, the improvements in their various markers of, of, of heart attacks and um, respiratory disease in their blood. And it reduced deaths in that area by several, uh, by several thousands, it was thought, um, just by cleaning up the air in, um, in Beijing for a small period of time. We know that air quality is generally poor in industrialised areas. Air quality follows like uh, a lot of the sort of inequalities that we see in health. So air quality is poorer in, um, in, in areas of social deprivation and in industrial areas and places next to roads and places without, um, without sort of green spaces as well. But overall, actually, the, the good thing about being on a peninsula is the air quality is actually generally quite good. Um, the World, Co World Council does do a, a, a report and, uh, and generally um, it, the, the air quality is pretty good on the world. So this is, um, as Simon said in the first talk, we've known about this for a long time. So these are old, these are quite old slides, but these are from Public Health England, looking at the causes of uh, all the various sort of main causes of um, air pollution, how it affects our health. So there's particulate matter, which particularly causes cardiovascular disease, like heart attacks, nitrous oxide, which I'm going to talk about because that's predominantly from transport, and then um, sulfur and, um, and ammonium as well. But we're going to particularly talk about nitrous oxide, nitrous dioxide, I should say, because this is what gets pumped out of diesel cars. Um, so it's, it's colourless and it's no laughing matter, which is a, a very sad chemistry joke because uh, nitrous oxide is obviously laughing gas, but nitrous oxide doesn't have any of those effects. Um, it's a highly reactive molecule that irritates and annoys your airways. Um, and it's a, an unfortunate side effect of diesel cars and vans. So we know that um, in many, many years ago when Gordon Brown was um, the Prime Minister, now it seems a very long time ago, um, that um, there, was a, there was an effort to reduce the carbon dioxide emissions and that encouraged the purchase of diesel cars. But one of the unfortunate consequences of that is that it pumped up nitrous oxide emissions. And we know that nitrous oxide, particularly uh, as a respiratory doctor, I'm going to talk about it, particularly affects airways and causes asthma. So you can see um, that over um, the next sort of, from 2017 to 2035, you're talking 300,000 cases, potentially more of, more of asthma than you would do if you, got, if you got rid of nitrous oxide. So, you know, that's a significant burden of disease. It also, because it, it's so reactive, it's involved with diabetes, it reduces birth weight. And again, anything that irritates your airways increases your risk of lung cancer. Um, there's not as good evidence for that, but certainly for asthma, we know that nitrous oxide really worsens your asthma control. Um, but what happened? But we know that how do we stop people? How do we stop this? Have we ever done this before? And these these graphics are all from um, sort of the first wave of the COVID pandemic. So obviously, personally and professionally, the COVID pandemic has been a real challenge, and that has that has for, for has for many people. But we can see that um, by reducing how much people travel and travel in the cars, you can dramatically reduce nitrous oxide emissions. So you can see in major cities, it dropped from sort of 40 um, parts, uh, parts per billion, I think it is, um, um, to less than 10. So, so less than 10 is considered safe by the WHO. And if you look at northern Italy there, you see it was very red, which is lots of nitrous oxide, and it's almost gone away amazingly. And again, similarly in China, you can then see the massive drop off in, um, in uh, nitrous oxide. So there was a, th this came through as, um, uh, as a, there was a paper in the Lancet with, which looked at a lot of this. And actually we, we may have avoided many thousands of premature deaths from air pollution um, by restricting transport and by the lockdowns that we did in that sense, as well as saving the lives that we did from COVID-19 due to the lockdowns. But it's important to say that this can be done and we can reduce transport. Like many things, um, these sort of problems aren't acute and don't feel like a COVID-19 pandemic. They always seem down the road, but it, we have done it before and we can do it again. So I always like to be positive with this. So what can we do? So there's technical solutions. So um, if you've got a newer diesel car, you put things like AdBlue in it, um, which reduces your nitrous dioxide um, emissions. You get better day, diesel engines. And as, um, and as um, Councillor Gray said, you can have electric vehicles as well, which obviously don't emit any nitrous oxide. There's political solutions though. 
So we can have ultra low emission zones. We can increase taxes on dirty cars and on diesel cars. We can pedestrianize and get people to walk more and move cars away from where people live. We can make greener environments because the greener environments, the better our clean, trees are very good at cleaning up the air. Um, we can encourage public transport um, as a political measure, but on a personal level, we can not idle our cars, which is a personal bugbear of mine. Um, and I don't spoil what I'll say, what we can do in our 30 seconds, but it might be that. Um, we can walk and cycle, as we talked about. We can use public transport. And a lot of these benefits aren't just um, impacting other people. They improve our personal health. We know the patients who, people, people who cycle are obviously healthier because they're exercising more. So just briefly to bring this all together, um, air pollution may be less, less visible now. So if you look compared to pea supers that we had in the 30s um, and smog, we don't see that anymore, but, but it's no less deadly. It's invisible and can seem intractable and really difficult to solve. But we have reduced air pollution in the past and present, and it's not like we need anything new, like we might do with carbon dioxide, where we need to develop carbon capture. Um, we have all the technology we need. It, it is a solvable problem, and we just need to solve it. Thank you. Don't go away, David, because the first question on the Q&A comes for you. OK. It's uh, from Sue Heighton. The findings of the inquest into Alakisi Deborah's death being directly related to air pollution has shone a light on the preventable deaths, more than a thousand a year across Merseyside. This is a health emergency and needs an emergency response. What should be done differently to address this and protect people's lives across Wirral? Should councils introduce systems to measure minute by minute PM 2.5, etc., pollution outside schools and housing areas near busy roads? So you know, if, if you read the council report, I'm sure Liz will say that there is, um, there, they do measure this on, in certain areas and certain hotspots that you see throughout the world where they're measuring um, nitrous oxide and um, particulate matter as well. I mean, it, it's like many of these things. It's 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 a, it's really it's really difficult. It's it's not difficult to solve. It just takes a lot of will and changes a lot of people's life. We know what we're solving. We reduce road traffic. We reduce people idling. We give people options. And Liz has talked about some of the options to talk about outside schools. Um, but it, it requires that sort of multi-pronged um, attack that we're not great at, I don't think. And certainly, as a as a as a doctor, I I don't control the roads, I don't control the other things. Like that. So it's I think one of the things I've learned since, since I've been a consultant for the last three and a half years, it's quite hard to be integrated and work across various different sectors. And I think we are getting better at that. We were working on that, and I think that's the only approach is to 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 work across it. So you need to make you need to encourage people to pick better routes of transport. You need to change the way people pick up. You need to stop people idling. So it's a complex, it's, it's, it is a complex problem because it requires lots of different things, but it's, it's actually the solutions are there. We, we know what works and we know how we can reduce this down. Okay, there is, uh, Liz, you might want to answer this one. It's coming up on the chat. When is we're all going to systematically and continuously measure PM2.5 pollution at schools and communities near busy roads following the King's College study that identified Birkenhead as the area, quote, most deprived and having the highest levels of air pollution? You need to unmute, you, you need to demute. Had to happen, didn't it? Um, thanks for that. Uh, yeah, as it's just been said, we, we are measuring particulate matter as well as other forms of pollution. And we are looking outside schools as well. And that's one of the reasons for the school streets trials. Um, we have just just last week, we've got, we've got this ongoing clean air campaign, which come, you know it, it changes regularly. And just last week, we sent out uh, a whole package of um, lesson plans and ideas and campaign ideas for schools to use with their children and their families about clean air. And part of that is looking at um, modes of transport to and from schools and engines idling as well. Uh, and just to inform them why, because the main reason when you ask people to turn their engines off when they're sitting outside schools, they don't know why. Um, and the, the legislation is problematic as well. So if you ask them to turn the engine off and they do, you can't do anything about it. You walk away and they put their engine back on again. Um, you just can't do anything about that. So we need we need national level legislation that will help local authorities deal with this problem. But we within the parameters of what we can do, we're, we are engaging with it directly with schools as well. Julian, actually on chat says this, can you tackle the issue of idling cars, as you mentioned? <laughs> the point is, she said, he says, um, it's a common sight to see people come to look at the sea in New Brighton, keeping their engines running. You also own vehicles, your own vehicles, WBC vehicles do it as well. Yeah, it's, it, it is that they have, you know, we, we, nobody's perfect. And we do know that even our own staff might not realize um, the problem. It, we've got, thousands of people working for the council and that, that 
obviously that uh, memo didn't get out to everybody. So it's an ongoing, like I said, the comms is ongoing. We, we deal with schools, it's ongoing. We deal with residents, it's ongoing. And of course we have to deal with our own staff as well. But most people do respond very positively when they find out why you're asking them. So the most important thing is to get the, the message across. Why do we want you to turn your engine off? Okay, Simon, question for you from uh, Susan Johnson. Not every older person can ride a bicycle. What other options are available apart from buses or trains? Well, obviously, there's lots of mobility uh, aids around at the moment. Well, I think, actually, uh, I had this discussion up in uh, Southport, uh, quite a fractious discussion about this very subject, you know, about, you know, that we, if you start closing parking spaces and reducing parking spaces and putting in cycle lanes and more pedestrianised areas, how does that leave the vulnerable and the elderly? Well, it actually gives more space to them. If less people drive into town centres and city centres, it means that where there are parking spaces, you can get them closer to where people need to be. The idea, the idea here is not to make sure that it's not it's not to lock people up in their homes and say, unless you're going to ride or walk, you can't go anywhere. It's actually to make sure that there's a, the facilities are there for everyone. And that's a really important part of the messaging because it's too too often. I had a really good discussion with some of the councillors um, down in Birkenhead. And that was, they said, you know, they've got quite, quite a you know, large elderly population down there. And, and they were really concerned that if you start to put an active travel measures in, then they wouldn't be able to get to where they wanted to go. But of course, they're part of the mix and they have to be part of the mix. And in actual fact, if you reduce traffic, motorised traffic, you make it more free for people who need to get round to get round. Okay. Um, actually, there was another question that made, oh, it's for David. Um, this one is very simple. One, Gillian asks, "What is AdBlue?" You mentioned it. Um, it's it's so I'm not an engineer. It's like it's it's synthetic urea, which is um that reacts basically with your with the nitrous oxide as it comes out, and then you get water and um, water and uh, I think water and oxygen and n nitrogen, which is um, inert and harmless. So it's it's just a me it's a method of reducing nitrous oxide emissions. So make sure so the newer diesel cars have it, and they won't drive unless you put some in it. As I as I've, uh, as my wife found out once. So um so you have to you have to fill it up to it, um, or they won't drive. And um, just sorry, just to come to Simon's, but I just want to say as well as one thing it is about making um at the moment the default thing is is to drive, isn't it? Um and it, and and we it's about trying to change that so the default isn't that so there's different options for different people. Because 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 that it's not about getting everybody making everybody go on the bike because that that's not going to work for a lot of people but it's about the moment so much of the default is that we drive somewhere without anything else and it's just about changing the mindset a little bit there's still people who people drive and I still will drive my car to work when I'm working odd hours and and, and everything we're still going to need to do that but it's about just changing the default and having those more options because we've been so wedded to the car for the past fifty years that we haven't thought about it beyond that. I would I'd also, I'd also just add to that as well, Roger, you know, because when if you look at the road system now, you know, when, when they're putting in the LC whips and this kind of stuff, what they're trying to do is give more space to pedestrians and more space to cyclists. But it, the most important part of that is to slow traffic flow down and make it easier to cross the road. And for the elderly and the infirm, nothing could be more important. So this is the whole point. It, it, it helps people be more active, but it also help, helps, helps people just move around without being, without being in fear that they can't get from A to B. Okay. Uh, Liz, from Naomi, what will you do that will improve, and it's relevant to what we just heard, what, that will improve car sharing for the Wirral in the next three months or 12 months? Um, well, we just need to get the idea across to people. People need to know what it is, apart from anything else, and how beneficial it can be. Um, that you know, there's a lot of um, time and effort and money goes into everybody being in their own little car. Um, it, it's it's going to be a very difficult job to try and promote that now because post COVID, um, everybody thinks of their car as their their own bubble, their family bubble. Uh, so we're going to have to think about how we promote that idea of of being safe in public transport and being safe sharing vehicles as well that's really that's going to be quite a tough one to get across uh simon uh, another question from naomi when will we be able to safely travel by bike from the east to the west of the wirral and vice versa mm -hmm. without having to take the circular route or brave motorway junctions yeah, you're great. Yeah, yeah, really good question. Um, and of course, you know, as as Liz knows, I've been, I know Liverpool very well, and I know different parts of, I know part, some parts of the world very well. Um, 
my parents moved overseas to New Brighton uh, a few years ago. But the, I spent a whole day traveling the M53 corridor, just finding out where you can get through. And, and, and then what is the art of the possible? And, and we have, I've had these discussions with, with the council officers, the relevant council officers in Wirral, because that's, that, is, that, that is the trick. The trick is, not, we, you can see the lines on the world. You can see that you, it, it's, quite, it's kind of, it's not that difficult to work as how you go north to south, north and south uh, and across the edges, but to cut through the middle is where a lot more thought is needed. And so that's all, that's all part of the work that I'm doing alongside Liz and Air Team is to just try and find out where, what is the art of the possible and then put pressure on, on the likes of Highways England because Highways England have funds when, they re, when they're changing junctions and when they're doing works on motorways. They have funds that can reach out into the surrounding area to improve the access for other users and to keep that pressure on and make sure that a bigger, a bigger part of that pot goes to this, these kind of interventions to get you across the M53, which is basically a massive barrier running down the middle. So that, that is that, that's, that's, the, that's the question, Adam, I'm still learning. Okay, David, for you from Gillian. Can I, I think it's for you, the others, can I ask how the shipping on the Mersey affects our air quality? Um, I don't really know, but I know that um, the dirtiest fuel that we use, because it's the cheapest fuel, is the one that powers ships. Um, I imagine we'll be somewhat protected as in it's, it's not in our, nobody lives right there. So a lot of this is very close to, um, if you look at the, the worst um, the worst air pollution, it's when you're very close and you're living right on a road, nobody lives absolutely right next to those ships. So I imagine you'll dilute it a little bit. But globally, shipping is a massive cause of carbon dioxide emissions, a, a, a massive source of, um, of, of, of uh, pollution as well. So it, but locally, I, I don't, I, I would imagine it's probably not going to make a huge impact. But I don't know, Liz would know more, maybe. Do you live? Actually, I probably don't know anymore. I do, I do know that it is pollution, and I know that the people are looking at um, ways of, of um, keeping the um, shipping in the area without necessarily having their engines running the whole time, and that's that's for air quality purposes, but it's also noise pollution as well. So I know that that is being talked about, so that could be the way forward. Okay, John picked up on what you were saying is about charging points, and he's saying what will be your further plan and will the charge be paid with credit card as is the case for petrol and diesel i don't know how they get how people are going to pay for it i assume you're going to wave your card at it um, which is increasingly the way that we the council is charging for parking so i assume it'll be something similar which is efficient and hygienic and there's an interesting suggestion from someone who's anonymous who says and i think this is the last it's not really a question but something you might want to pick up on has any thought been given to the idea to give all Wirral families a family travel pass similar to the pensioners travel pass for Merseyside for the holiday periods to enable them avoid using cars and take their children to cultural and leisure amenities? Quite a lot of children in Wirral don't get to go even to the seaside. Do you want me to answer that? I think that's a fantastic idea. I think that's absolutely wonderful. And that, but that's a conversation we'd have to have with Mersey Travel as well. But I do think that's a great idea. And of course, there's a cost involved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunate. OK, uh, we move on now to the second part of this event, where we'll be looking forward to the potential solutions available to get us to go where we want to go. In other words, how to make sure that the Wirral and its residents have adequate and sustainable transport provision and importantly, how can we ensure that people will use it? So we're going to hear short presentations from <sighs> Warren Ward, or somebody's got their uh, mic over there, from Warren Ward, uh, who is the Executive Director of the Royal Chamber of Commerce, from Janet Atherton at Cycling UK, and from Ellis Palmer. And that'll be followed by another Q&A with speakers in this section. So first, Warren Ward, whose Chamber Departments are responsible for policy and global trade, agro sectors including energy and sustainability, manufacturing, tech and social economy. Busy man. He's keen to promote cleaner solutions within these key sectors and to get all the partners working together smoothly to achieve net zero status. He represents rural interests nationally and internationally via the British Chambers of Commerce and he's been listed in the Liverpool City region's 30 under 30 list consecutively since 2016. So over to you, Warren, please. I'll have to tip somebody who did that introduction for me. <laughs> Good to see you, Robert, and, and, and thank you for, um, for having me this evening. 
Uh, I think firstly, I just want to say uh, I'm really proud to be here representing Wirral Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we're not new kids on the block. We've been here um, since 1912, so we've been representing Wirral industry um, for over 100 years. And we've seen lots of change in our economy, lots of shifts in trends and priorities. Where I have to say, certainly over the past five years, a lot of these changes that have been implemented is very much for the betterment of our economy and our for, uh, and our community as well. And from a business point of view, um, I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you uh, to the Combined Authority and Wilbur Council uh, for all of their fantastic work that they've delivered in partnership with organisations like ourselves and for leading the way really in the region on climate change. Now, like many, Dara mentioned this pandemic, but it's it's provided us an opportunity not to pause, but certainly to reflect on the way that we've been running our economy. And, you know, from, from our point of view as a chamber, we've got an opportunity here not to go back to how things have been and not to just recover, but to actually renew the way our economy works and to drive forward something that's more sustainable and that benefits all of our communities. Now, diving deeper now, into the particular impact of climate change on, on our own business community. You know, on the, on the one hand, it creates a series of new business risks. So besides the most obvious physical risks, so the uh, extreme weather events, supply shortages uh, caused by such as the water scarcity, you know, companies are exposed to transition risk, which arise from, you know, our society's response to climate change. And that includes changes in technologies, markets and regulation, and anything really that can increase uh, businesses' operational costs. And that undermine the viability of their existing products and services or affect their asset values. Um, and one of the biggest issues as well, uh, sorry, whilst we do have lots of issues um, in climate change, we've got a series of unique opportunities for our business community this is opportunities such as improving their own productivity uh, for instance by increasing their energy saving reducing costs climate change can also and this is something that i've seen firsthand going out and speaking to our business community it can really spare innovation it can inspire new products it can inspire new services it can look at things and make them less carbon intensive um, and look at reducing carbon that's used in industry. But equally as well, uh, climate change provides an opportunity for our business community to look at the resilience and enhance the resilience of their supply chains. Uh, this is, for, for instance, looking at not being so fixated on fossil fuels and shifting towards renewable energy, because whether we like it or not, that is coming our way. And we need to start working hard to get to that point where we're less reliant on fossil fuels and looking at renewable energy solutions. So together, uh, these actions, you can foster competitiveness, you can unlock new market opportunities. And that's precisely what we aim to do uh, as a chamber. It's about inspiring our businesses um, to do that and to drive this forward, as uh, alluded in my introduction. We've established a high growth sectors team. It's a new, highly resourced, dedicated team. And what we've done is we've clustered together a series of sectors that are the contributors to the issues in climate change, but equally the um, the solutions to climate change as well. For instance, we've got our manufacturing and our maritime sector uh, together, and we've got our digital and tech and energy and sustainability sectors together. By having these sectors uh, clustered together, they can learn from another and we can look at those solutions. Now, some examples of what Wirral companies have been doing and Smiley's who are based in Bromba, they're a logistics company, who literally export around the world. And we've talked about shipping briefly um, this evening. One of the surprising things that I'm going to uh, share with you this evening is that Smiley's, despite being in what's a very- Sorry, uh, let me interrupt you. You've got a minute to do all this bit, I'm afraid. So oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get to the point. Smiley's, which is in a, a very export intensive and, and dare I say dirty sector, are actually carbon neutral and they've won uh, international and national awards, including the Queen's Award for Enterprise in doing that. And they've done it by just looking at common sense. So rainwater harvesting, uh, new cycle to work facilities, uh, 
with their plants in Bromber, they've got a wild flower meadow, 50 new British trees, 50 new fruit trees. They are leading the way. And I'll conclude on this point. Climate change is very much on the agenda for the private sector. And while some sectors do contribute to that, some sectors and businesses are also the solution. And by bringing them together and looking at that cross-sector pollination, we can drive forward this change that's needed. Uh, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. Everyone has a role to play in this. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That's a good one. Thank you. Now then, Jan Janet, Dr. Janet Atherton is currently chair of Cycling UK, which is the nation's cycling charity. She's passionate about public health, has extensive experience working as a director of public health in both the NHS and local government. She was president of the Association of Directors of Public Health from 2012 to 2015, got the OBE for services to public health in 2015. She's been director of public health in Wirral and Sefton, and more recently has worked as an advisor to Public Health England. She lives in Wirral, got back on a bike for the first time in many years in 2012, and she's a ride leader with Wirral Bicycle Bells, a cycling group who runs sociable rides for women. Janet. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to share my screen, hopefully. Oh, one moment. Is that okay? Can people see that? Yeah, got it, Janet. All good. Yeah, okay, brilliant. Thank you. So, just um, in terms of uh, my background, the, the obviously Roger's introduced me but as chair of Cycling UK for people who aren't familiar with Cycling UK we're the national cycling charity we've got about 70,000 members across the UK and got a really strong contingent of members within Wirral who um, run rides and uh, campaign for better conditions for, for, uh, for cycling. We work very closely with all the walking and cycling associations across across the UK as well because we believe that it's walking and cycling together that will make a huge difference. In terms of the two things that we try to do around campaigning the better conditions for people who cycle and support for people to, to ride as well. And absolutely believe that cycling is for everyone. Um, and in terms of that, the basically whether you're actually just starting out pootling around the block, pootling to the shops, or you're actually cycling around the world. So we've got some of the current world record holders for cycling around the world amongst our members. Um, Simon earlier on mentioned about the government cycling strategy gear change and we're really really supportive of that because they actually took on board quite a lot of the the input that we um, put into that and currently now around our campaigning work we've got two strands to that there's um, attempting to influence the elections coming up next week around the mayoral elections and obviously local council elections and PCC elections too it's absolutely critical in this next period that we've actually got um, people in local government who really support this agenda understand it and will really have the political will to change stuff but also really importantly the comprehensive spending review the national comprehensive spending review in the autumn because without the resource to go along with gear change we're not going to be able to do the, the, the things that are needed a lot of what um, Liz and Simon have been describing earlier on they're absolutely right about what's needed, but I think the, the pace of that needs to be upped and the only way to do that is through having additional resource. So our vision um, for cycling is, is actually about making sure that places are designed around people and not cars, that it is possible to actually, the everyday journeys could be done by bike or, or walking, and that results obviously in cleaner air and better health and wellbeing and a really green recovery from COVID. This was this is just a map from the um, consultation that Rural Council did last year, actually, Rural Liverpool Streets, which asked people what they thought about their, their local um, roads and environment and what could be done to improve their walking and cycling experience. 1,300 um, comments made on that with a lot of kind of endorsements from other people. So, and obviously interest spread right across the Wirral. I think, although we've got low levels of, of cycling at the moment, there is certainly a huge amount of demand. Just looking around, you'll have seen that more people are out on their bikes um, and also walking. That's also been backed up by uh, the active um, the active live survey that Sport England published earlier on this week and um, the recent stuff that the um, Department of Transport have published around 45% increase in cycling um, 
mileage over the last year. So there is absolutely demand. Um, we hear a lot about the kind of the, the anti stuff, so the, the cycling chaos and whatever, um, but actually the silent majority really do want additional investment in cycling and walking. This is a cartoon which um, has been done for us by Dave Walker as part of the election campaigning work that we're doing at the moment. And it really highlights some of those simple changes that people in rural were saying that they wanted. So things like getting rid of the restrictive barriers. I can see that that looks like Ellis to me, um, trying to get along the River Burkett. Um, people wanting safe routes to schools, not wanting rat running through their neighbourhoods, protected cycle lanes, places to store their bikes and, and uh, park securely when they actually go to the shops and that kind of thing. So nothing, a whole load of things need to come together to make this work. Um, and it, it sounds like this, obviously within the Birkenhead plans, for instance, those types of things are being built in, um, which is great to hear. Just to show this slide, um, just because I mentioned earlier on about the, the pace of change um, and for, there will be kind of there will be campaigns against this type of thing. We've seen that, you know, when, when it's been um, done in London and the like. And people often refer to places like, well, they can do it in the Netherlands, can't they? And, and all the rest of it. Um, I like to think about the places who have started really from quite a low base like us, who've changed things very quickly. And this map is of Seville. Um, who really had very little in the way of the cycling network in 2005. Um, political will there actually wanted to build a network and build it fast. So you can see how that changed just by 2008 and then 2010, a really comprehensive network. And I think the key to this in terms of the success they've had has been the pace at which they've done that. So that they have actually been able to achieve change quickly and people can suddenly see that actually, yes, this is a means that, a, a way that we can get around. Obviously that needs resource, but I think critically political will. The, very short, 30 seconds. Okay, good stuff. So the other place I would really highlight is Paris and the Ville du Cap de 15 minute neighbourhoods. That's something which is absolutely achievable. If you think about the nature of rural, we can do that. We've got townships, we've got, most people can reach most of what they need to do actually by bike or walking within 15 minutes if we get the right infrastructure in place and people feel safe. So they, I just are ask finally for um, of local authorities is actually about supporting if we want to make sure that people are elected who actually support the need to double um, and put the investment in to double cycling by 2025, the target in the uh, gear change strategy and the whole thing about an active travel network um, of safe, uh, safe routes, direct routes and highly high quality design. Thank okay. You. Thanks a lot, Janet. Chance yeah, of didn't quite manage me 30 seconds, I don't think, but close. I don't know. <laughs> At the end of when we get to the next bit. Um, Ellis now. Ellis Palmer is a disabled journalist and hand cycle user based in West Birkenhead. He only started hand cycling at the start of the pandemic and someone living with cerebral palsy doesn't think it would be an option for him. Since taking up cycling, March 2020, he has cycled over 9,300 kilometres, mainly around Birkenhead and the north of the Whittle Peninsula. Ellis, over to you. If you're there, I think you are. But you need to turn your video back to Technology, when it works, is a wonderful thing, Roger. When it doesn't, uh, it's a bit of a stick cut. Sorry about that. I also managed to, just at the time, I was about to go on screen, shut down my laptop with my notes on, so just give me 10 seconds. Right, there we go. So to start off with, a little bit about my hand cycle. Well, you might be thinking, what's a hand cycle? How does it work? There's various different options. There are recumbents, which are kind of all together, kind of hand cycle sort of things. My own personal hand cycle is actually a clip-on hand cycle. So it's a wheelchair. Um, kind of a, man, a manual wheelchair just as it would be with a clip on at the front. It takes me 30 seconds maximum to be able to clip on my hand so I can clip and go. I've got a little bit of power assist on mine because I, I live on Bigston Hill. So uh, getting up and down the hill both at the start and the end of the rides can be a bit of a challenge. So I've got a little bit of power assist for getting around and about. As a disabled cyclist, the main barriers for me when I'm out and about are probably 
surfaces and well, what do I mean? The surfaces and, and kind of barriers, of course, the standard U frame, but councils all over, and particularly in such trans routes, there tends to be quite a lot of apparently. On the national cycle network, there are 16,000 such barriers, um, somebody was saying to me yesterday, and they're trying to remove them. It's a very painstaking job, but they are they are the biggest barrier in terms of getting on and getting off routes tends to be, particularly if it's off-road routes, tends to be the, the, the U-frames or the A-frames in some cases. But more, more than that, it's surfaces. It's about thinking about how you design the space and thinking about how you design that realm because it's okay if you remove, say, a U-frame barrier, as Will accounts have done along with River, River Berker, and they put in A-frames, which some say is controversial. But then what you have beyond that is you have a very, very uneven surface with lots of um, with lots of potholes and one thing another. I know Eddie Ram obviously is hosting this tonight, is a big fan of the Lane, but I actually find off-road routes up the Lane to be quite uh, frustrating because they tend to have quite an uneven surface and tend to be quite difficult to negotiate. My favorite routes on the wheel, seriously, I don't think you can beat a good old Seacombe to New Brighton on the Mersey Superhighway. I think it's absolutely stunning that we've got that pretty much on our doorsteps to be able to go and cycle and go and be able to enjoy. It's, it's quite incredible. And obviously it's it's barrier free as well, which, which makes a massive difference for hand cycle user such as myself, and also the surface is quite even, which generally tends to be quite good. My other favourite route would be Bromberpool to Port Sunlight, just because it's a really nice little hidden gem. I mean, I will say I actually quite enjoy road cycling, and I don't think you can beat, you know, zooming down Laird Street or, you know, careering down uh, careering down Beaufort Road, or some, some of those routes can be absolutely fantastic routes I actively avoid and why routes I probably actively avoid would be if I was cycling independently I would avoid probably the land I don't I generally avoid off-road off routes if I was cycling by um by myself um just because they tend to be quite a nightmare to negotiate uh if I if I'm cycling with somebody I can they can generally help me out, but if I can buy myself off-road routes, tend to be things I would avoid. Um, what can be done? I'm sorry, I wrote my own question here. What needs to be done to improve the infrastructure and resources? I think on the one hand, it's about infrastructure. So it's about barrier-free, it's about consistent surfaces, it's about if you're a non-disabled cyclist, if you're a non-disabled cyclist or non-disabled road user, thinking about how disabled people might experience the route. And that's a big thing in city planning. You know, city planners have to think naturally, they have to think about, about how disabled people would experience it. And in terms of resources, the barriers when it comes to resources tend to be things like costs, hand cycles tend to be, and any kind of assisted cycle, because more often than not, it's made um, bespoke. Non-standard cycles tend to be quite, expensive and there are grants available and things like that but it's about resources and information and disabled people thinking that it is something for them because all too often there's not the visibility about and around on the peninsula or further afield thank you very much roger thank you very much indeed during your time now then q a unfortunately uh warren can't be with us with this q a but ellis and janet more than happy to deal with your questions and this comes for both of you, it's from Naomi. Um, let Ellis have a rest, so you start answering, Janet. Two thirds of all journeys here are three miles or less, but more than half of these are taken by car. What needs to be done to encourage more people to safely and conveniently walk and cycle? I think the, the key to this is, is actually about getting some more kind of highly visible infrastructure and actually enforcing some of the uh, the infrastructure that is there already. So there's lots of parking in cycle lanes, parking on pavements and all the rest of it. We could do much more to actually improve the quality of the infrastructure we've got just by enforcing some of the um, 
and things there. And I was pleased to hear what um, Liz was saying about reducing speeds as well, because again, if, if, if traffic is going at, at lower speeds and people feel safer to ride. I think that there is a really important point which has been come up in the chat there about actually a lot of our infrastructure isn't really geared up to 24/7 use and is um, and doesn't necessarily feel safe if you're on if you're on your own either, um, either as a woman or a disabled person or whatever. Um, so we really need to make sure that it's kind of alongside the main routes and um, it's direct to people's destinations so that it's the most convenient place, the co most convenient, um, obvious way to to travel. That's where we need to get to. And then it's what. what do you think needs to be done more to encourage people? It's about visibility, really, Roger. It's about people visibly seeing people using cycling as a way of getting from A to B to C and getting around town rather than something that's seen as a leisure pursuit. It's okay to do your 20 miles on a weekend or whatever, but people need... I was in London the other week, and people in London, you know, they, they use the cycle as a way of getting to the office or getting to the shop or meeting the friends for coffee. I bet that makes that makes a big difference. People actually can see people using cycles for shorter routes and shorter distances and cycle and parking is available as well. If there's that visibility, then people will think, oh, it's going to be an option for me as a way of getting around. I think cycle parking is really people feeling safe to leave their bikes. Um, you know, it's something that business actually people who ride bikes to local shopping shopping um, places are actually going to likely spend more money than if um, people who are, who are going in cars you know, go to out to town shopping centres or whatever. So actually, it's, it makes just in terms of chamber of commerce, it makes really good business sense to actually provide um, facilities for cyclists so they can leave their bikes safely while they pop into your shop, stop off at your coffee shop, whatever. And on that, on that point, there's so many small independent businesses that I've discovered that I wouldn't have yeah. discovered if it hadn't been for passing by them on the bike in the local area. Indeed. Interesting one for you, Janet, from Claire, who says, how, how can we encourage more children to use bikes when the majority of our roads are not designed with the protection of cyclists? Well, I think it, certainly one of the things that I would say that in, in terms of developing a network, then we need really need to prioritise safe routes to schools. Um, there are also things that can be done actually around kind of school opening and closing times to reduce parking by schools so that it's safer for kids to walk or, or scoot or cycle to school. And I think that kind of combination of different means of active travel, the, the um, this week's been the Sustrans Big Pedal, and they, uh, they've just recorded three million active journeys um, as part of that, uh, which basically kids either walking, cycling, scooting to school, which is fantastic. So there clearly is demand. I think the schools really have to support it. So actually making sure they've got facilities for the storage of the, the uh, bikes and scooters at school. Um, and they really need to push that with, with parents as well about actually, it's better for your kids. They arrive at school in, in more ready to learn if they're active on the journey to, to school. Yeah, Don't bring them by car every day. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good point. Should safe cycle storage be compulsory at all schools in Wirral? I, I, I mean, it, I have in my old, old hometown, my, <laughs> where I come from originally, there, there's a school there where a secondary school where just about all the kids cycle to school. They've got huge cycle racks and, you know, fairly basic cycling infrastructure around the school. But, that, you know, it's, they've created a culture change. And I think that's really what we need to be doing in our schools. OK, and it's a question to you from Alan. I think somebody may have their mic open here. Uh, barriers to cycling also come in the form of actual physical barriers. Gates that are there to prohibit motorcycles from using the paths can also prevent adapted bikes at a wider or have a larger turning circle to get through. Do you think Wirral Borough Council should conduct an immediate audit of existing cycle or walking infrastructure to ensure it's compliant with gear change standards? Because WBC is still installing unlawful barriers which exclude those with mobility issues and or non-standard cycles. Just say yes. <laughs> I'd say yes. I was I, I was amazed. I was amazed yesterday. I was on the Liverpool route line yesterday, and I was amazed at every single entrance and every single exit to the Liverpool route line. There was a barrier that wouldn't be accessible for a wheelchair user, for a scooter user, for a hand cyclist. Every single, every single entrance and every single exit 
had you frame had, had you frames and it was just completely inaccessible it's a broader issue than just for rural it's just trying to estimate the 16,000 of these barriers around the uk on the, that's just on their routes and i think that that is a big problem it is a, it's a broader problem i think it's not just about removing barriers it's about thinking about the surfaces and thinking about the terrain you have around those barriers so, for example, with, with a Burkett situation, they removed the U-frames and put in an A-frame because that was what was kind of available to an extent, because that's still, my argument is there probably still has to be some kind of barrier, some kind of barrier there because the local residents have asked for it or whatever. But that barrier, if there has to be a barrier, should be the least restrictive barrier that, that can be put in. And it's about understanding where, the borough council are coming from when they're putting in these barriers and understanding the concerns of the of the um the highways person understanding what what they're trying to achieve and what you what you want to achieve and then realizing that but it is also about the terrain it's about the burqa it's great say for this example it's wonderful but then but they even if you get rid of the barriers, there's still a lot of things that would stop a hand cyclist and a non-standard cyclist being able to, to use that area. It's things like terrain, potholes, sudden hills that come out of nowhere to entrance and exits. So it's about the broader picture, really. I, I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't think anywhere is ideal with this when it comes when it comes to off-road routes because because a lot of the off-road route is, is, a legacy, is a legacy route. So, but part of the problem is it, it's quite patchy. You know, some bits. Of, I was in Hull. It's not just that I was in Hull last summer and cycling the Hull to Hornsey route. And the whole bit of the route is actually quite good in terms of there's not that many barriers on it. And then you get to Hornsey and there's loads of barriers and the terrain's very inaccessible. So it's about the broader picture. Okay. We've got to move on, I'm afraid, to the next section, but just a point from Philip Barton, not to be answered, but just to throw it in. He says, don't forget that it's illegal for wheelchair users to cert use certain cycleway punishable by an on-the-spot fine. So not all barriers are physical, there are still statute barriers as well. That's worth knowing about, I think. Okay, for this third part of this evening's event, we're going to look now at how we can get where we want to go. We're going to hear short talks from each of the MPs who are joining us today. We'll then be putting your questions to each of those MPs. And first, Dame Angela Eagle, who's a Labour MP for Wallasey, has been an active member of the Labour Party since she first joined when she was 17. She was first elected to Parliament in the 92 general election, and previously Minister of State in the Department of Work and Pensions. She currently sits on loads of committees, including the Treasury and Procedure Committees. Angela's first government role was in the Department for Environment, Transport and the Regions, where she was appointed as a Parliamentary Under Secretary of State. So, over to you, Angela. My gosh, that was a long time ago, Roger. I know, but, but you're a young woman still, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, for uh, inviting me and it's been a fascinating um, discussion so far and I think um, often when you're thinking about the climate crisis and, and what we can all do together it often appears to be so big and so all-encompassing that it's very difficult as an individual to know what it is that you can do and I think one of the great things about tonight has been everybody's focusing on very very detailed locally based solutions which are obviously only a part of the transformations that we have to have but I think that um, those transformations are so profound that they have to be done almost from the bottom up and the top down at the same time and everything in between otherwise we're not going to uh, uh, make the transformation and stop catastrophic climate change. I think um, the Covid crisis really has demonstrated how unequal and unbalanced our society is and not only from a social point of view but from an environmental point of view how unsustainable it is both socially environmentally economically and that's partially because we're following the wrong economic philosophies uh, which see pollution which see uh, uh, damage to the environment as an externality with no price 
And that's why we've um, done so much to destroy the natural environment at all levels since we began to uh, uh, develop economically. Uh, we've moved so far away from uh, the philosophies that animated the first um, people who had to live sustainably, the first human beings who were very in awe of the environment and worked and lived within it. So the issue is how can we try to um, redress this balance in a really, really fast way now? How can we build an environmentally and socially sustainable future, both in the rural and for our country, but also for the globe? Because we know that if we don't do that, um, then our uh, future looks pretty grim. Um, to focus more in on what we've been talking about tonight, transport accounts for I think about a quarter of all greenhouse gases that the UK uh, emits and government action and its pledges seem reasonable, uh, but it's too little too late in a lot of ways. If we look at um, buses, for example, uh, that's 82% of all journeys by public transport. Uh, and yet uh, fares have gone up and there's been a huge cut in real terms in uh, the amount of buses and bus routes that are available in our area. So if we're going to ask people to get out of their cars and use public transport, we've got to make it practicable and, and affordable for them to do so. And we've also got to make certain that those modes of transport, when, when they are available to use, are easy uh, and, and convenient to use, but also are cheap enough to be a practical use for families, uh, whatever their uh, income. And we're very, very far away from that. Um, trains, for example, 40% increase in fares since 2010. Uh, lots of big announcements about uh, new trains, but very little delivery by the government, although uh, Mersey Travel have introduced the, the new train systems, which are at least um, accessible for those who are, uh, are in wheelchairs. I think that Liz and her colleagues in the council are doing a fantastic job to try to deal with uh, cycling and walking infrastructure. Um, but I have to say that having uh, going up and down from uh, Wirral uh, to London, if you think that the issues around the uh, controversy about cycling and the cycling paths in Wallasey are difficult. You should try what's happening with the uh, with the ULES zone and the congestion charge zones in London and the new safer streets where they've fastened off streets so cars can't get down. Huge controversy about that. And so politicians who are going to do this have to also hear from the silent majority who want it done, as well as those who think it's a difficult problem and kick up a big fuss about it. So I, I think it's important um, to support uh, moves towards a cleaner, greener, sustainable future. Um, if you agree with it and you see your local council trying to plan for it as we're all doing, you've got to be vocal in support and not just leave it to those people who don't want to see that kind of change and who don't want uh, to uh, think that cars might be becoming a thing of the past. They won't become a thing of the past unless we make it easy, convenient, cheap, and sensible to be able to take other routes. Now, bringing that uh, that change about is going to be hard, but I think we're all council have made a really good start. Thanks for that brilliant timing. Uh, thanks for that, Angela. We'll hear from you again in a moment in the debate, but uh, we turn now to Mick Whitley, who was elected in December 2019, currently a member of the International Trade Committee, has an expertise in the automotive industry, undoubtedly, because he worked at Vauxhall Motors for decades. Before his election, he was a trade union organiser, later a regional secretary or the regional secretary for Unite. Mick, over to you. Thanks, Roger. Uh, and it's a huge privilege to be uh, able to speak to you all uh, uh, tonight, uh, following on from the um, excellent contributions that we've heard. As an MP, one of my top priorities is securing an ambitious green industrial revolution that revitalizes left behind towns like Birkenhead and creates, creates the well-paid, highly skilled green jobs of the future that my constituents uh, deserve. The climate crisis is the single greatest threat facing the world today and it's heartening to be joined by people who share my passion for bringing about the change that's needed to leave a greener, livable planet for future generations. And also conscious that we've had, uh, we are hard pressed for time. So I wanna focus on two key areas, decarbonizing the shipping industry and electrical vehicle air production. 
The shipping industry is one of the world's leading contributors of carbon emissions, contributing to uh, 3% of emissions annually. And this is only set to grow over the coming years, with the International Maritime Organization having agreed to a 14% increase in emissions up to 2030. We can't pretend to be serious about achieving net zero emissions if we don't have a radical and credible plan to decarbonize shipping as soon as possible. The recent announcement that emissions from shipping and aviation will be included in the UK carbon's budget is a positive but long overdue development. It's another sign that this government is playing catch up on the climate crisis rather than truly setting the agenda. Decarbonizing the shipping industry is a historic challenge, but if it's successful, then we'll, we'll, we'll reap the benefits. The shipping industry already plays a usually significant role in Birkenhead's local economy, and that's only going to grow as the Liverpool free ports becomes a reality. And by establishing the UK as a world leader in clean maritime and building up our export industry, we can create many new green jobs at Camelaird shipyards and secure its future for a lifetime. This is a top priority for me and something I've been working to achieve since being elected. There have been some positive steps from the government. Before Christmas, I met with the junior minister for the future of transport to discuss the, this issue and think there's much in the clean maritime plan that should be welcomed. But I remain deeply concerned that the government's ambition is still failing to meet the scale of the crisis we face. Most of all, the government needs to be doing far more to promote green hydrogen as an alternative to, to the pollutant fuels current used by shipping fleets. No option be, should be taken up the table and there certainly needs to be far more research into the viability of fully electrified long haul shipping. But I believe that green hydrogen is at the moment way, the way surest way to decarbonize international shipping. I also believe that the green hydrogen has a vital role to play in greening wider supply chains, especially in transitioning the steel industry away from its over reliance on coal. The developments of the hydrogen economy from the potential to transform the economic landscapes of the Northwest, creating new high quality jobs and bringing much needed investments to Birkenhead and the wider Wirral region. Already we have much of the infrastructure needed to make hydrogen revolution a reality. That's why I'm so emphatic in my support for the High Net Northwest proposal to create a Northwest low carbon cluster. But having spoken to campaigners and industry leaders over the last few months, I feel that the government's sequential approach to the development of low carbon clusters risks creating a system of winners and losers when what we desperately need is, is to be doing is ploughing full speed ahead with any and all projects that bring us closer to, to achieving net zero carbon emissions. The North West cannot be left behind. <coughs> Excuse me. Along with MPs from Whittle, uh, Cross Whittle and Cheshire, I've been calling on the business secretary to change course and ensure that the low carbon projects on, in the Northwest can go ahead without delay. I'm also deeply concerned that the government is not doing enough to support the transition towards electric vehicle production. By 2030, the production of petrol and diesel cars will be banned, but we're still a long way from electric vehicle uh, revolution that Boris Johnson promised. As someone who spent 27 years on a shop, shop floor of Foxwell's car plants, I'm deeply concerned that the government has yet to step in and make the necessary investments to enable the plants to transition towards the production of electric vehicles. This week, I spoke in the Westminster Hall debate on the proposed closure of the GKN Automotive Parts plants in Birmingham. There, you might shop have drawn up realistic proposals to convert the plants to the production of electric parts, but despite the closure threaten, threatening hundreds of jobs and the government's own targets, ministers are also refusing to save the plants. Transport ministers have also failed to build the three electrical battery gigab gigabit factories that will need be needed by 2025. Yesterday, I called on the government to ensure that one of those should be built here on Merseyside. The concerns of lack, lack of action on these issues show they truly don't understand the scale of the climate crisis, but also demonstrates just how important it is that people like you come together in groups like this to affect real change. So I want to thank you once again for inviting me to speak today. If there's any, anything I can do to support your campaign, then don't hesitate to let me know. Thanks, Roger. Thank you very much indeed, Mick. And that takes us to our third MP, Margaret Greenwood, who was elected in 2015 for Wirral West. Former teacher, community activist, founding member of Defend Our NHS, that Merseyside Place campaign group, originally formed in 2011 to oppose the Health and Social Care Bill. Up until Margaret's appointment to Labour's front bench, she was a member of the Environmental Audit Committee. 
which led the campaign against underground coal gasification in the de estuary has opposed proposals for the Hoylake Golf Resort and is committed to protecting the Green Belt. She served as Shadow Secretary of State for Work and Pensions and Shadow Schools Minister. Over to you, Margaret. Um, I, I don't seem to be able to start my video, Roger. We got you. Oh. I can now. <laughs> thank you and good evening. Um, thank you very much. And uh, it's so good to be invited to speak to everybody today. And apologies that I wasn't for, here for the first part of the meeting. At the point when I came in was touching on some of the things that, that I'd like to talk about. I think as other speakers have said, you know, we're all aware that transport um, makes a, a huge contribution to CO2 emissions more than any other sector in the UK economy. So it is um, incredibly important we deal with this as a matter of urgency. Um, and do whatever we can to reduce uh, our impact on the environment in the way that we travel. So thinking about what we can do locally, and it's been so interesting to read the chat and about people's enthusiasm for e-bikes and the sort of small local knowledge, uh, by small I mean as in physically, geographically small local knowledge that can make a difference. Um, you know, if we're to encourage walking and cycling it for local journeys, then we have to make our streetscapes a lot more friendly for uh, pedestrians and for bikes. So in this, I believe that attention to detail is incredibly important. So things like drop curbs for prams, buggies, wheelchairs, and for pedestrians who have mobility issues. If you think about somebody, maybe an older person who struggles with a pavement, uh, you know, you will have a situation where somebody could actually probably walk to the shop if they could use the pavements, but actually may end up having to get a taxi purely to do their shopping. So these small details, I think, make a huge difference and we have to pay attention to them. Um, things like pavements where they're needed and lighting where it's needed, but also improving the environment overall, because of course, people are much more likely to walk if the environment that they're walking through is very enjoyable. Um, it's been mentioned about the, the experience of working from home over the last year. And I think that this, you know, people have adapted, people who were able to work from home have adapted very quickly being able to use things like Zoom and Teams. And there's a real opportunity here for us going forward in terms of, um, you know, thinking about the workplace. And I know it's quite a controversial issue, but personally, I think that um, we should be looking very carefully about facilitating home working um, for people to avoid people having to spend two hours a day commuting in traffic and, you know, gathering, um, skeletal problems on the way as they sit in a car in a, a traffic jam and so forth, whilst putting out um, emissions into the environment. Im improvement to public transport is absolutely fundamental. And, um, you know, um, I think Angela was talking about it. Bus routes in particular are so important. We lost, uh, one, one bus route went off between West Kirby, Irby and Heswell. I had a huge post back about that. People writing to me saying they felt stranded. They'd lived there for years. They could no longer go and see their, their relatives, they could no longer do their shopping where they wanted to and so forth. So it's very important that we have control over the routes that are served. The problem that we've had, we got at the moment is we have a situation where operators compete on the most popular routes. So if you've bought a, a week pass to travel on a Riva and a stagecoach bus comes along, you won't get on it because you've already paid for your transport on a Riva. That kind of choice makes absolutely no sense when it comes to um, bus systems. So it's massively frustrating and wasteful. Now, um, just to mention, obviously we've got elections next week, Steve Rotherham's um, standing again to be re-elected as mayor. Some of the things Steve's been doing um, are precisely about tackling this issue. So he's been working to re-regulate the bus network so that they work in the interests of passengers rather than shareholders. And um, so at the moment we have this issue of bus routes being taken out at very short notice by operators with no regard whatsoever of what that means for the local community. And for journeys costing, in some instances, twice as much as the same journey would cost, similar journey would cost in London. So we need to be able to, as a, we need to be able to set our routes and fares for the benefit of communities. Um, so this is this is one of the things that he's committed to, along with ensuring all new buses are talking buses as standards, which is important for people um, in terms of accessibility. Trains, again, very important. And I know there's been discussion about accessibility. I know when the Mel's lift was um, put in last year, last March, um, campaigners locally had, had lobbied so hard for that for such a long time. 
And it was a huge day when that, that arrived because before then, anyone coming traveling from the direction of Birkenhead heading towards West Kirby, but who wanted to get off in Mel's, would have to go all the way to West Kirby and come back again if they wanted to get a buggy or a pram or a wheelchair off the train. So it really was, to say it's inconvenient, it just didn't operate. It was not fit for purpose. So, you know, it's really good that that investment's going on. And I understand with the new trains that are coming down the track, sorry about that, the new trains that are coming down the track, um, the, the stations are being uh, adjusted to, um, to accommodate them so people can get off and on the train without assistance, which will be fantastic for people. Um, and there are 52 of these trains. Now, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, um, you oh, know, there's been a delay. One minute left. One minute left. Oh, right, I'll skip on two. Uh, essentially, as Angela was saying, it's about affordability, ease of access. So one of the things that I know Steve Rosner wants to bring in is a London-style transport system where you can tap in and tap out, and there'd be uh, daily fare caps, which would be really fantastic for passengers. And again, then the other issue is we've got to get 30 million uh, petrol and diesel cars off the road. Massive challenge, and the investment that Nick was talking about in terms of battery technology is hugely important. Uh, but we also need interventions to make them more affordable to people. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Margaret. Thanks a lot. Uh, you'll have time, of course, in this next section to get some points that you may not have been able to do because of our, our three of our MPs are happy to take your questions now for the next 15 minutes. I'm going to offer each question to one MP and the offer, and then you know the other two can respond if they wish. But we have only 15 minutes. Hopefully everyone will respond as briefly as possible and as efficiently as they have done so far. First, uh, Angela Eagle from Alan Robertson. Can our MPs publicly support the transformational cycle route planned to run between Birkenhead and Wallasey? How can we ensure work on this route is not delayed or disrupted by a minority of very vocal opposing voices? Well, I think the opposing voices have been organised, dare I say it, by the Conservative Party ahead of the election. Um, we just have to, and I, I did hint at this in, in my comments, the silent majority who agree with these sorts of things never get heard. When planning things happen, what often happens is those who object make the loudest noise and they're the only people you hear from. So I think people who support the cycle routes and people who want to see, as I do, that kind of development, um, we want to be like Seville, don't we, let's face it. Um, we need to hear from the people who agree so that we don't just hear from the people who disagree. I think the other two want to pick up on that. Nope, good. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the next question is for Mick anyhow, Mick Whitley. Uh, it comes from Nikki Crosby who says, how should local and national governments seek to reduce emissions from private cars? Uh, <clears throat> Well, obviously, we're, you know, we're, the, the, the legislation that's coming in in the 2030 will end combustible engines anyway. Uh, so the emissions uh, will, will finish then. But there's, uh, you know, it was like the uh, it, somebody earlier on in, in, the, in the debate was talking about cars idling, uh, you know, at schools. Now, there's technology uh, already out about that where you have stop and start engines. So if you stop your car, the, your, your engine automatically cuts out. So there, there is technology around uh, to do these things. Um, so, I mean, but, you know, I think, uh, you know, it, it's the governments uh, to uh, make sure that, you know, they've got the proper emission levels uh, or to lower emission levels uh, to the manufacturers. And that's, a, you know, that's got to be built in by the manufacturers, in my view. Angela or Margaret want to respond on that one or not? No. Yeah, go on. Uh, yeah, yeah, just on, sorry, yeah, just on that point, um, you know, one of the things that needs to happen with electric cars, there needs to be government support for people buying them, because at the moment, one of the things that Labour Party's proposed is provide a long-term interest-free loan, because, you know, the upfront cost is expensive, but then they are uh, less expensive to run over the longer term, and if people could have that, you might, you know, you'd be able to sort of incentivize uh, more people to be able to acquire them. And like with anything, when new technology is being, being um, developed, you know, if you can get to a, a sort of sizable mass of people wanting something, then you can get a kind of step change in terms of the, 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 the what you're able to deliver to people. Exactly. You want to speak. I think you've frozen me, haven't you? 
you wanted to say yeah go ahead. yeah just very briefly it's a, it's a mixture of the government getting involved um margaret's right about electric cars and subsidies but also you need tax incentives and tax disincentives to for, for the more polluting ones then you maybe you could have a scrappage scheme which would uh, enable people to um to get rid of their older more polluting cars and have help to get newer vehicles but the government also needs to be in a situation where it's helped the development of uh, an infrastructure for charging people won't get electric cars if the charging infrastructure is intermittent or non-existent so you've got to help the new technology along um, and lead by uh, allowing this transformation to happen using tax incentives, subsidies and, and, and things like that. And we don't have a government at the moment that believes in an industrial strategy or intervening in the market. It seems to think that the market will just sort these things out. It won't uh, when it's this kind of new technology. It didn't during the Industrial Revolution. That came about because of great innovation, but also government involvement. And we need that again. Okay. Uh, this one's for you, Margaret. Uh, from Nick Woodrow. Politicians in France have recently considered banning internal short haul flights where trains can get you to the same location in less than 2.5 hours. What's your view on the policy? Do you see other similar levers that the government can use to dissuade short haul flying disproportionately used by a minority of travellers? I think it's a really, really um, interesting idea that the French have taken forward here. I, I don't know. I don't know much about the volume of internal flights. Clearly, if we had better public transport and swifter public transport, um, people would be less likely to use it. I don't, to be honest, it's not something I've looked at. It seems like a good idea, um, but you'd, you'd want to look at, um, you know, how much it's going to save and so forth. Anything that can discourage people from taking internal flights has got to be a good thing, I would say. Nikki, you on this one, all right? Yeah. Um... I think, it's a, I, I think it's a good idea, but, you know, you've got to have the infrastructure uh, in this country. Uh, you know, if you, if, you know, for example, I mean, I was at a meeting in the, in the, uh, at the aviation um, meeting a couple of uh, months ago, uh, because obviously when, when, uh, the, uh, when the uh, pandemic hits, it, it, it really hits 92% of the aviation industry. Uh, you know, uh, planes were cancelled, uh, planes, uh, Airbus got a lot of contracts cancelled. And uh, but when when we were talking, uh, you know, discussing this, they're talking about uh, introducing new composites uh, to build planes instead of uh, aluminium. They're also talking about uh, electric planes as well, uh, you know, sustainable uh, electric planes. So the, the you know the the new technologies are getting developed all the time, uh, you know. So whilst they agree, uh, you know, to stop uh, short or if you can. But the infrastructure on the ground's got to be uh, got to be there. You know, it's if you, if you can't get a train, uh, you know, to London or you know to around the country, well, it's no good. You know, so uh, I, 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 I agree with the concept, but uh, you know, it, it's it, you know, it's no good if you haven't got the uh, infrastructure in place. Okay, and Andrew, you want to respond? I think on this one as well. Yeah, just very briefly, Mick's absolutely right. You can't take things off and hope that somehow an, an, an inadequate infrastructure will, will help you. You've got to make these transitions and give people proper choices. Uh, if we manage to get electric engines and lighter planes, that will transform aviation, certainly short haul aviation. I'm not sure how we'd get an electric plane across the um, Atlantic, but, but you know, short haul, that, that would be a good thing. Uh, I think also um, the, the things that we've learned during the pandemic, look what we're doing now. We didn't all have to go and sit in the same room to have this meeting tonight. And although it's a different experience, I suspect that the vast majority of these short haul flights are actually business related flights, which are paid for by the business. Um, they could be made more expensive in order to discourage and people could use Zoom a lot more for their business meetings. Okay, thanks for that. Um, somebody says they can't hear me very well, but uh, as long as you lot can, that's fine. Um, <laughs> it's not very important anyhow. Uh, this one is from Mick from uh, Ewan Wilkinson, who says, given that much of the transport planning over the past few decades has been how to increase the efficiency and capacity for cars, smart motorways, my goodness, what level of commitment and resources will be used in the world to increase the capacity of urban spaces rather than roads, 
and safety and freedom of pedestrians and cyclists? How will the powerful car lobby that has been demonstrably effective recently be kept in check? I think that's a, I think that's a question for Liz, uh, for Liz Gray. <laughs> <laughs> Come to you. <laughs> I mean, I, I was thinking, well, I, Mick, um, you didn't write smart motorways, but I certainly am worried of that. But Angela's going to respond anyhow. Go on. I think you're right about smart motorways and the fact that they're going ahead the way they have that they are is a disgrace. But anyway, that's that's another issue. Disgrace is people are dying on them. I, I, th I think that um, <clears throat> I think that the real issue here is that there have always been lobbies that are more powerful than other lobbies in a democracy, and you've got to try to balance those out. And again, it's the people that you don't hear from. Um, and the people who don't lobby behind the scenes with great economic power that you've also got to hear from their voice. But I do think given the number of drivers there are, instead of having a big war with them, you've got to try and move everybody forward together um, by the new technologies, by the shift, um, and by encouraging people to shift modally from one series of transport to one bit of transport to another but by making it easier for them and then once you've given them choices you can then think about making it more expensive for them to continue making the choices that aren't sustainable anybody else on that or move on no nope. um margaret well, this is for margaret but obviously you all three want to respond to this one from naomi who says may is Living Streets National Walking Month, 30th of May to the 5th of June is Cycling UK Bike Week. Could the panel let us know how you will be supporting these weeks? So um, that's a really nice question. And um, I'm looking forward to doing quite a lot of walking to, to support the first. Cycling would be slightly more difficult for me as I don't have a bicycle. Um, and can't cycle one due to an injury acquired some time ago. Um, I'll do anything I can to support those. So if people have got ideas that they want me to promote or, you know, have got things that they'd like shared on social media or anything that people would like to sort of be to take forward to publicise, I'll, I'll do whatever people would like because they're great initiatives and um, be very happy to do that. Okay. Do you want to respond on that one, Andrew? I take it you will be supporting it in some way or other. Of course, I think um, uh, uh, some of us are walking rather a lot in the next six days. Um, I wonder why. Uh, for, for other reasons, but yes, more than happy to. And uh, Mick? Yeah, fully, su fully support it. I mean, uh, you know, I, I started to do a lot of walking myself now. I, I, don't, I don't ride bikes like, but uh, I do walk a lot. But, you know, if anyone wants uh, any help and assistance in the, you know, Doing you know the, uh, for bike weeks or walk and, and anything like that, and I can help and assist uh, by all means. Get in touch with me. Okay, some questions here, and then I'm not sure who they're for. We've only got what a couple of minutes left or so. But anyhow, what prospect is there for incorporating the railway line to Neston into Merseyrail, which with additional stations could greatly improve transport throughout Wirral? Anybody go on that one? Yeah, I, 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 last week we was, we was at Rock, Rock Ferry. Uh, we're talking about uh, disabled access. Uh, you know, there's a problem uh, there. There's also a couple of problems on a couple of stations on the Whittle uh, for disabled people, uh, you know, accessing the station. And uh, I was talking to uh, Liam and Robinson, and they're, they're talking about, uh, you know, opening up. There's a stimulus. I think the, the, the Welsh, uh, the D Mersey Alliance, uh, are talking about a stimulus package. Uh, which could possibly open up that, uh, you know, Bitston line going through to uh, Wrexham and possibly uh, in the future, they're talking about electric trains, not the uh, rail or overhead uh, rail, but, you know, but, uh, you know, uh, elect uh, you know uh, battery uh, packs. Uh, the only problem that they've got on, on that at the, at the moment, uh, what they seem to be saying is that they haven't got the technology, uh, you know, for the, the, the weight of them trains going up gradients uh, when he gets to, uh, to uh, like Shotwick and places like that, uh, you know, there's a difficulty. But they uh, they are seriously looking on that. He was also talking about the possibility. I, I think one of your uh, one of your listeners there has just come on talking about uh, a wood church, uh, a, po a possible station to, a, a wood church as well. Uh, you know, where uh, people can access that, go to Bitsna and get onto Mersey Rail. So it's good stuff. But you know. Um, 
rail, you know, when you're building rail or you, you know, you're altering rail tracks and you know, you, you know, you're planning, it takes a long time. You can't do it overnight. It takes it's years in the planning. So I mean, it's not going to be, it's not going to happen anytime soon. But I, I wish it did. Uh, Angela or Margaret, do you want to respond on that? Uh, the, the opening of the Bidston line has been a long-standing demand from people who remember it often when it was open, uh, uh, you know, and if it could be done, that's great. But let's also not forget buses, because 82% of public transport journeys are taken on the bus and trains are always more romantic. I know that um, and I share the romance myself, um, but but buses are, are, the, are the sort of boring but really essential thing that can make it easier for people to commute. At, at the moment, I think it's cheaper to take an Uber than have a bus journey. And it's far more convenient because an Uber will arrive far faster than most of the buses that we're served with at the moment. And so we could do a great deal more, I think, to uh, make it possible for people to go on public transport in buses. And I just wanted to say, because uh, this is probably the last um, time I, uh, I um, uh, sort of contribute to this particular meeting to thank everybody for inviting us. It's been fascinating. Uh, and to say with respect to um, climate change and all of these huge issues, whether they're reflected in what we're doing locally or what we have to do internationally and nationally. There's a Danish philosopher called uh, Saron Kierkegaard, and he said that possibility and actuality do not differ in essence. Uh, but in being. And what we've done today is try to bring the possibility um, that's in essence at the moment into being. So keep up the good work, everybody, and we will do it. Okay. We do have to finish. We've got half a minute left. Margaret, you want to add, add anything to that? Uh, well, I didn't realise I was going to have to follow Kierkegaard, Angela. So thank you for that. <laughs> but what I wanted to say, because I can't, but um, what I wanted to say was just to reiterate the point, particularly around buses, how important it is to lobby for the routes. You know, it's massively important. And this goes back to the point, I think it might have been Janet was saying about the silent majority. Um, and it's, it, it's hugely important. So where there are routes missing or routes have been cut, please do get in touch with any of us so that we can support you in lobbying for those things because they are crucial to people um, and you know people shouldn't sort of suffer in silence when bus routes get cut that's all okay we're now moving into a different rather unusual I'm not quite sure what's going to happen section for 10 minutes i think it is uh with laura de henning so laura explain all thanks roger i'll just get us set up um, so yeah, thank you to all our fantastic speakers. Um, now it's time for you to have your say about the future of travel on the Wirral. Um, so during the next few minutes, we'll have some reflection time for our audience um, where you can contribute your thoughts anonymously to our virtual cloud, um, which we'll, we will share on the screen in a second. Um, but we'd like you to answer this question on the screen is, based on what you've heard today, what do you think should happen next? Um, so you can share your words by going to www.menti.com and inputting the code on the screen, which we'll also paste into the chat in just a second, or you can access um, via a link I'll also paste into the chat. Or alternatively, you can be very tech savvy and use your smartphone and scan the QR code on the screen and it will take you to the web page and all you do is input your idea as a little um, thought. Um, so I'll just leave this slide up for another minute or so and then I'll start sharing the word screen and magically we should see lots of exciting proposals appear in front of us. Um, so please do take this time to add your thoughts. Um, and I'll just swap slides in a second. And the code for direct access is now in the chat. Oh, already getting some answers, which is great. Shows me it worked, which is fab.
some good themes coming out already, picking up on all of our speakers' contributions as well, which is, is great. Um, please do keep adding your thoughts um, and this won't close. Um, so if you want to keep adding your thoughts post event as well, that's fantastic. Um, and we'll also share the Mentimeter with you guys um, in the follow up email. So you have it um, as a little record of the event. And we'll also make sure that MPs and councillors on the call today have it as a nice um, reminder of what everyone on the call today would like to see happen. Fantastic. Great. Um, well, we'll leave this open um, for the rest of the event. Um, but right now, we'd like to give each of the speakers, the panellists, the opportunity to give their proposals for the most important thing um, that should happen next to improve our sustainable transport network on the Wirral. Um, so if all of our panellists from tonight could turn their video on. Um, and it's now back to you, Roger. Yeah, indeed. And we'll go through the order in which they spoke. So first of all, Simon, 30 seconds, what action? Um, very simple. Um, 35 years ago, I sold my car. It was an angry statement as a, an angry environmentalist. I realised very quickly the quality of my life went through the roof. I never get stuck, stuck in a traffic jam. I eat and drink what I want. I save thousands of pounds a year. Keep the message positive. Tell everyone that this is what they, not, not what they should be doing. This is something they should aspire to do. Make them jealous of the way we live, jealous of our aspirations and get them to join in. That's simple enough, Council Liz Gray. Liz, where are you? There you are. Thanks. I totally agree with Simon there. You've got to actually do it as well. So you, we really do just need to be more active. Um, however, my point is uh, I think we need to lobby for more government funding because they are saying the right things. They're absolutely saying the right things. They're just not paying for it. And they've starved local councils. We've lost 250 million in the last few years. And we can't, so we can't afford to do what we want to do. So we need to lobby the government for funding. Thanks. Dr. David. Toppy, David. I suppose, as I said in my talk, the simplest thing that we can all do is, is, is turn our cars off when we're, when we're not when we're not moving. Um, but actually, picking up a bit of what Angela said, I, I suppose separate that is is making our voice heard and not being the only people, not letting the, the naysayers and the, the people who are against something be the only people who are speaking. I think that's probably individually the biggest impact we can probably have. Okay, thanks, David. Dr. Janet Atherton. Yeah, for me, it's it's about joining up that national funding and policy with the local political will and kind of tenacity to make it happen. And we've really got to up the pace of what we do because we are talking climate emergency. We can't wait 10, 15, 20 years. We need a generation of school kids who are able to walk, cycle to school from tomorrow, really. And Elliot, Elliot Palmer. Just want to thank 30 seconds. Um... I would just say when you go out and about on your local walks, on your local cycles, in your local community, think about the barriers that a disabled person might face, be it pavements, be it roads, be it uneven surfaces, whatever it may be. Think about those barriers and try to act on those barriers. Talk to your disabled friends and see what they want to change in the community. Nice and brief. Thank you, Alice. Angela, Angela Legal. Uh, we need a government that actually walks the walk as well as talks the talk and we need to make certain that um, dealing with the climate emergency and creating a society that's socially and environmentally sustainable is at the heart of any everything that any government in the future does. Mick, Mick Weekly. Yeah, I agree with, uh, <coughs> with Les. I think uh, we need more funding from the government uh, for Merseyside to do the things that uh, we need to implement to get the, uh, the Green Revolution underway. Simple and Margaret, Margaret Greenwood. I, I, I'd say uh, encourage people who can to work from home and to walk locally and to make our streets pedestrian. <coughs> Thank you all. Uh, finally, to end this evening's event, Miss Catherine Jenner. When she unmutes and switches on her video. <laughs> Catherine, you're very dark, can't see you. 
Oh, my apologies. I think it's my it's my system. I'm 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 deeply mysterious. But um, for those of you who can't see me, I'm Catherine Catherine Jenner, member of of World Climate Action Group. Turn um, the lights on. <laughs> <laughs> I have to stay mysterious. It's obviously my, my wonderful machine that doesn't work. But um, I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Um, on behalf of the group and everybody here today, I'd really like to thank all our speakers and MPs for contributing so thoughtfully to this event. Uh, we've had lots of brilliant ideas and questions, many of which unfortunately we haven't had time to answer. But World Climate Action Group, as, as Roger says, will follow up on them as, as soon as we can. Um, reducing emissions from transport is one of the key challenges the UK faces in reducing its carbon footprint. Um, and as, as Angela alluded to, the surface transport accounting for 24% of 2019 emissions. The scale of the issue is evident and requires a similar scale of ambition to meet it, which is as true on a local level as it is on an international one. Um, with COP26 on the horizon, Clean transport is one of the five campaign areas. It's important that the UK takes a leading role in the shift to sustainable transport. And there's no reason why Wirral cannot show a leading example. What we've heard tonight tells us that there's a lot of great work underway across Wirral to cut transport emissions and tackle climate change. But there's so much more to be done, as we've heard, if we are to be close to meeting our emission reduction targets. What was clear this evening is that action to reduce transport emissions has positive benefits for well-being, health, and nature. Wirral has the potential to be the greenest borough in the UK, and a sustainable transport network could be at the heart of such a target. So I ask you all this evening to do three things. Number one, think about personal action you can take, whether it's leaving the car at home, few days a week or using the cycle to work scheme to buy a bike there's something we can all do to play our part number two talk to your friends neighbors family colleagues educate others about climate change and transport to normalize cycling and walking here on the world and number three speak to our elected representatives action needs to be taken at all levels and as we've heard again our voices matter uh, and hope for the future can support you in doing that. So you can also join us, join Wirral Climate Action Group or another local organization, um, a brilliant way to take action on climate change. Uh, as Ed mentioned at the beginning of the event, Wirral Climate Action Group, are a group of active local residents involved with climate change issues across the Wirral. We would really love to have you on board. So please do get in touch by replying to the follow-up email that will go out early next week. Uh, this will give you more information and resources linked to what we've been discussing today, uh, information about Wirral Climate Action Group, uh, as well as more information on how Hope for the Future can support you in meeting your MPs. So all that's left for me to say, I'm sorry I'm in the dark, <laughs> is to thank you again for all, to all our wonderful speakers. Um, thank you to our team behind the scenes, especially all at Hope for the Future. Um, a big thank you to Roger for chairing our event so well yet again, and a huge thank you to everybody who's um, attended our event. Um, you should find a feedback form pop up in your browser after this window closes, so please do take a couple of minutes to fill that in if you can spare us the time. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening and I wish you all good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.